the Lord to connect today's passage with um, perhaps the upbringing that we have received from our parents and allow us to uh, go deep into meditating on how the image of God has been shaped and formed and influenced by our upbringing. And maybe there's a place of healing that needs to happen. So let us pray that God will uh, open up our past in the light of the uh, passage that we'll be reading tonight. Father, we ask that you'll open our eyes and our heart and our soul so that the light may come in. Come in through the cracks of our brokenness and shine light upon the dark places, corners of our lives and our memories and our past that we didn't know that you, uh, we didn't know that we had. We have long forgotten about those places. Father, we pray that your uh, word will speak to us in the events of the past and emotions and, and, and um, behavior that is colored by our past. Father, we pray that you will uh, knock on our door gently and we ask for your extra patience or some of us may resist uh, opening the door out of fear and shame and perhaps even um, rebellion. So we pray that your Holy Spirit will work with us patiently. And we thank you for that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Uh, tonight, we're going to look at a picture I think two of you in here have seen it, but that's okay. I'm going to share the screen. And hopefully you guys can see it. Do you guys see it? If you do, give me a thumbs up. Okay, so everyone sees it. Okay, excellent. So this is the picture, um, depiction of Moses killing an Egyptian taskmaster, a slave driver. And you can tell by the whip that has fallen on the bottom. Let's see if I can get something cool happening. Mouse select, draw, stamp, spotlight, stamp, select, mouse, text. Spotlight. Here we go. Ah, here we go. Yeah, you see the uh, a whip that has fallen on the ground. I want to, I want to give you a minute to look at this picture and, and see what you get out of that. Okay, uh, what are some of the things that you notice in this painting or this etching? I don't know if I can see your comment because I'm sharing your uh, sharing the screen, my screen with you. But please comment. Hmm. 
Yeah, so some of the things that I notice in this text are as follows. One, you see Moses here, and you can tell by his decorative, uh, I don't want to call it a skirt, but clothing compared to the taskmaster. He has uh, an additional decorations here and around his neck. And what's really telling about the character of Moses is this. One, that he's a physically formidable man for he is holding on to this Egyptian with a, such a force and power that the brick just below his head is cracking and is falling. You see these three bricks here. And he is being so forceful, is making sure that his body gesture is leaning forward and he has his left leg between the Egyptian taskmaster's legs, further immobilizing the one, his, his, his prey. What is disturbing about this text is that one, he is looking. He's looking to see that there is no one watching him. And off to the distance here, you see the slaves, or Hebrew slaves working away. But unbeknownst to him, to Moses, there's a witness in the left corner. There are two uh, blunt, weapons of choice in this painting, in this etching, and that you have a small mallet looking thing over here. But this text, this painting is, a, its etching is disturbing because he chooses to go for something that is bigger and that will do the job for sure. Finally, the third thing that is disturbing about this painting and which gives us insight to what Moses, what Moses was like before he met God in the, in the burning bush, is that this is a premeditated murder. So the artist, I think it's John Martin, uh, don't quote me on that though, uh, painted, depicted the scene by showing this little sheltered area where you see a little vase, a little bit of a jar, uh, possibly with refreshment and a table where taskmasters can come and rest. So he laid down his uh, whip and he came into a shelter to rest and Moses followed him. And as he followed him in, he pinned him down, chose his, chose his weapon. And now he's looking around to see if anyone's looking because he has been following him and is determined that he will kill him. So this is what we uh, understand about Moses here. And this is something that's important as we go into tonight's text. So tonight I'm going to ask, we're gonna, we're gonna do three readings and I'm going to be asking you a, a lot of questions. So the picture is not really part of today's text but simply a backdrop of what we're about to read. So this is our first reading tonight. I want you to juxtapose or superimpose the picture with what we're reading tonight, okay? So you have the image of the picture in your mind and you're going to sort of hold that and read this text. And the picture should uh, influence or the way you think about the passage that we're reading tonight, okay? So this is our first reading, which is a snippet of chapter three and snippet of chapter four. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. God said, but I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and tongue. Then the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth 
and teach you what you shall speak. But he said, O oh my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he's coming to, you, coming to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You will speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. Take in your hand the staff with which you shall do the signs. Let us meditate on the text that, we, that I have just read for you. This is our second reading for tonight. And this time, I want you to pay attention to Moses' interaction with God. What is he feeling? Why is he so resistant? What are the reasons that he offers to God? Come. I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute, or deaf, or seeing, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall speak. But Moses said, Oh my Lord, please send someone else. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. Amen. Let us meditate the interaction that Moses has with God and pick out his fears, resistance, and reasons why he does not want to answer God's calling.
Okay, Moses says that he's not eloquent. Absolutely true. Yeah, in his eloquent, in his lack of eloquence, he may look foolish. He lacks the decorum of a proper politician who is trained and honed in the art of uh, debate and oration. He's slow of speech, doesn't know what to say. That's right. Hmm. That's right. He, Moses picks out the primary reason why he's not a suitable person for the calling that God has made upon him because he has to go and speak to the Pharaoh and speak to the people. Yeah, I am absolutely sure that his past has also um, checkered and colored his decision. He, he, he killed a guy for crying out loud and he, he really did a good job on him. Hmm. That's right. He doesn't, at the end of the day, Grace, like you said, he doesn't trust God to provide him with the things he need, but it, in Moses' defense, like, I mean, would you? That's right. He's not worthy of the task because one task that he's that God is looking for, one quality that he's looking for, Moses lack. But let's look at this verse again. And really pick out some of the details of what Moses is saying, okay? So I'm going to read for you one more time, a truncated reading. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and tongue. What are some of the details that we haven't mentioned so far? And what do you make of this text? Oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Why is Moses so so insecure and so resistant. That's right. You can't, he, he doesn't think God can do anything about his, his inability. Maybe, maybe God doesn't have to, um, but he feels that there's a certain way that he needs to be. Content versus style or delivery. Yeah, I, I sometimes think that too. And I, I try to remember that when I preach myself. <laughs> Yikes. So tonight, um, I'm not trying to be a, a, a nitpicky here, but I, I want you to look at something that we, you, you none, none of us have mentioned tonight. Okay, I'm going to read again. And this is really fun, at least for me, and I'm sure uh, it is for you as well. But let's really look at the text. Oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither in the past, either in the past, or since you have spoken to your servant, but I'm slow of speech and of tongue. How long? Let me um, ask this question another way. How long have Moses had this condition of not being eloquent? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Mackenzie. That's right. When you're walking like Egyptian, you can't learn. As they have a speech disorder, some people have guessed uh, that he has a speech impediment, which is, is, I mean, all of these are guesses, Rachel, but um, which may explain the fact that he is so aggressive, like he's violent. Maybe it, part of that violence comes from the fact that he can't express himself. So I'm going to give you a... Um, that's right. He can't be verbal about it. He can't talk things out. He just got to like, do something because it's a pent up emotion. Like it's the word heavy here. And I'm giving you a little bit of a preview of today, uh, Sunday, uh, the Sunday sermon. You know, when uh, the Bible says uh, Pharaoh has hardened his heart, the word harden and the word heavy uh, or slow is the same word in Hebrew. And it means heavy. So when Pharaoh has hardened his heart, it just literally means that his heart is so heavy that it will not move in any other way. Even God himself can't move it. So he, has, he wants to keep the Hebrews. He wants to kill the Hebrews. And that murderous intent is unmovable. His cruelty is unmovable. And that's the same word here that, you know, that Moses is using. Slow means heavy. His tongue is that heavy. Just like Pharaoh's heart is heavy and it's unmovable by God, Moses is saying, my tongue is unmovable. Even you can't move it. And there's a play on word here when the Hebrew readers are reading this, like, oh, God can't move Pharaoh's heart because it's so heavy, so to speak. And by the anyway. So in the same way, when, when Moses says, my tongue is heavy, uh, whether it's speech impediment or whatever it is, it's serious impediment to speech. So um, the things that we may notice here is that one, he is not eloquent. Okay, so we got that. But how long has he, has he not been eloquent? How long has this condition, how long has Moses had this condition? Since the killing the Egyptian, possible. Yeah, very possible. But whatever it is, Suji, yeah, it might be all of his life. It might be since killing a man and he just feels so traumatized. We don't know. I mean, we're just guessing. And, and part of this kind of guessing is what excites me. And this is what makes me kind of linger around the scripture and um, meditate. But in, in the past, or since you have spoken to your servant, and, and there's... A deliberate ambiguity there has God spoken to Moses before we don't know so has God spoken to Moses when he was 20 and he's still not eloquent or is Moses just speaking about present condition like you know you want me to talk and I'm talking now and, and even now I can't speak so you see me stuttering and the words are coming out like one word per minute and, and, and they're not even like good words. They don't, they don't even make sense. Or maybe, yeah. Ah, Suji, that's my next point. What do you think of the slowest speech? He may not. Uh, and, and this is a guess as well, Suji, is that he, he might not speak Egyptian well. Or maybe he doesn't speak Hebrew well. I mean, I have a dominant language. I'm a bi technically a bilingual, but I have a dominant language. Um, but for Moses, he's been living in a desert for 40 years. So maybe he doesn't speak either of them very well. And what he speaks now is a median dialect. And he's, he's good at that, like speaking like a Texan. You know, like he has a weird um, 
accent when he speaks his, his Hebrew. So it, it is, this is really, really bothering him. And, and, and this is a reason good enough. And, and let's reel back a little bit. Let's come back a little bit. What did Moses do when he saw an Egyptian man hitting another Hebrew? He killed him. So he was passionate about freeing his people, helping his people. But what gets in the way now? What gets in the way of that um, great vision of helping and serving his people and maybe even liberating his people? It's his, his speech. And that's what is getting in the way. And for him, this is a good enough of a reason. So, what do you think? Okay. Why didn't God pick Aaron, who is eloquent in speech? Why did God pick Moses? Why not go straight to the guy who's eloquent to begin with? Why didn't God pick Aaron, Moses' older brother? This is a more of a more difficult, uh, it's, it's a bit more um, challenging question. So yeah, take your time. There's something special about Moses from the birth, and you're right. Yeah. God wants to glorify himself, not glorify a man or a person and his or her abilities. Ah, okay, interesting. All these interesting thoughts. Mm. Now Moses would be able to know that it's God's doing, but Aaron, I think, is due to his own skills. Absolutely. We don't know. We don't know if uh, what kind of passion Aaron had for his people, but presumably because he's a persecuted uh, ethnic group that he would feel equally passionate about, maybe even more at this point because he's living in Egypt. He wants to free his people and he wants freedom for himself and his own, his, his own family. So we can sort of guess that he is passionate. So all of these things I'm saying, like don't quote me, but these are all just conjectures and meditations. Bible is, is deliberately uh, ambiguous or um, has omitted the details of these questions that I'm asking or the questions that you're asking. Yeah, um, and, and this question can be brought further into why didn't God choose Romans? Why did Jesus come to the Hebrews, the Jews? And why didn't Jesus pick Pharisees who were smart and eloquent and well-educated? Why does Jesus say in his teaching on the Mount, blessed are those who mourn and hunger and thirst and and the people who are less and weak, why does God keep choosing the broken people who are mourning, who are hungry but can't get satisfaction and who are poor? So this is one place where we, uh, a fruitful place for us to meditate on. Why did God choose me? Is it because I'm Aaron? Or is it because I'm Moses? And anyone who goes through their Christian walk thinking that they're Aaron is in for a big surprise because scripture teaches clearly the other way. 
that scripture chose, that God chose Moses, and it's clear, he chose the lesser in some way. So this makes us think about our own um, calling and our own uh, status in the kingdom of God and how we ought to be grateful and thankful that we are all equal in the family of God. So then, uh, the final question for second reading is that, what does this tell us about God who calls someone like Moses and not Aaron? What does this tell us about God? God doesn't see what we can do. And that frees us to have a genuine relationship with God, even in our in the midst of our failures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that God's love is not conditional for us, Fuji. That God chooses whom he chooses, and he has chosen us. We have to be very grateful for that. Okay, this is a final reading for tonight. And I believe I have one more question after that. Okay. Yep, I was right. Okay. As uh, for, the, for the third and last reading, I want you to meditate on what does this text tell me about God? God who chooses Moses, God who chose Moses, not Aaron. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of land of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? God said, but I will be with you. But Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither in the past or since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and of tongue. And the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But Moses said, O oh my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he's coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people and he shall be your mouth and you shall be as God to him. Amen. What do you notice about what God had to say to Moses? I'm going to take first three comments and I'm going to close tonight. God is accommodating. Come as you are.
Yeah, isn't that interesting? That God doesn't say, Moses, you will be, you know, golden tongue preacher from now on. Yeah, God doesn't want, Mo he wants Moses as he is. God is dependable. He has detailed plans, but he won't give Moses what he wants. And that's what's puzzling about this God that we, we worship. And God doesn't give up. Okay. So there, uh, actually I lied to you. There are two questions um, that I want you to think about. And I'm going to cut and paste. So if you forget, you can visit. Oh, did it work? What? Start posting. There we go. So the two questions I have for you, and, and some, something to something for you to walk away from, and uh, I recommend you thinking about this when you are alone, when you have some quiet time, even if it's just five minutes. One, how is God different from your parents? What were they like raising you, and all the things that we talked about and we meditated on the way that God treats you. Uh, God treated Moses versus the way that God, uh, your parents have treated you and raised you in the past when you said, I can't, or I'm not inadequate, I'm scared, I don't want to do it. Or when you had deficiency or lack or inability, what was their response to you and how is God different from your parents? I really want, I would like to invite you to think about that. And as an application question, where in your life is God calling you to just your life for his people? So, uh, and, and this is, leads nicely to my uh, conclusion. Moses had a reason. He had, he, he's slow in speech. And he had this condition, whatever it might be, for as long as he can remember. And God is catching him at his sore spot. You know, if God said, just lead people out, you know, like, a, like the way that you shepherd your flock, he may have done it. But, uh, or, or be a warrior, you know, go out and, and get people out into the battle or whatever. But it's a speaking role, and he has to speak on behalf of God, and, and that's a sore spot for him. Is there a place in your life where you feel, I cannot be, I cannot follow you, I cannot respond to you because I have this one deficiency, and unless you address it, unless you fix it, unless you make it go away, I cannot follow. I cannot just, I cannot do what you want me to do. You know, it might be children. It might be, well, I'm too busy. I, or I, I'm not, my gift is not this, or gift is, is not that. Um, Christian calling is not about what you're good at and what you can offer to God because you're so good at it. But it is, when you look at people of God, people's God, and when you know who God is, how does this God heal you? And how does this God call you to respond to his family? Namely to the church and, and rest of the world. And that's something that I want you to think about as we conclude tonight. Don't let your insecurities, inadequacy, or your inability get in the way of responding to God because he is the one who has made everything. That is all. Thank you.